Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our next episode of Making Hazing History with Mike and Hank. I'm your host, Mike Eilon, CEO of Greek University, and our co-host back with us today is Hank Neuer. He is the author of Hazing, Destroying Young Lives, Wrongs of Passage, High School Hazing, and The Hazing Reader. Now, usually this is about where I tell you that he has retired from Franklin College, and Hank was retired for all of 21 days, and now he's already back to work at Ball State. Amazing, Hank. How are you? I'm doing well. As I told you, Mike, I'm the Sugar Ray Leonard of academia. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely nice. love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Well, congratulations on uh, the new position at Ball State and congratulations on the new home. Uh, so all, all good things that are happening here. Um, and of course, we wanted to get back into some of our discussions and your research that you've been doing on hazing. Today, we're going to explore Masonic and also adult service group hazing deaths. And uh, this one is just so fascinating. I, I know we talked about it a few weeks ago and I couldn't wait to get into some of the details, but this was a hazing death case. Uh, the name uh, was Daniel Reese and the bystander is really what's notable ab about this particular case. The bystander who could have intervened was none other than Benjamin Franklin. Unbelievable. Tell us more, what happened here, Hank? Well, basically he was present when the perpetrators went over their plan to pull a joke on a sort of, dip, he's described as a basically simple or dim-witted in, in the early discussions. Uh, he certainly fell for this hook, line, and sinker. And so what Franklin heard was they were going to do a quasi, a prank, a quasi-initiation ceremony, similar to what the Masons were doing at that time. There was uh, uh, foolish type of pranks, riding uh, a mule or having a machine. And so uh, this Daniel Reese was aware that they were doing uh, these kinds of things. And clearly, in some cases, it went over the line, as we're going to talk about in terms of fatalities. So uh, later on, Franklin admitted that he laughed, said, I may eat, this is a quote, I may even have laughed uproariously, he said, but I didn't know they would take it that far. Mike, where have you heard that before? Oh my God, numerous, numerous times. No student ever, you know, whether it's a student athlete or hazing in a fraternity or sorority, nobody ever sets out to kill somebody. It's an accident that happens that nobody could have predicted, yet we find ourselves in that situation over and over and over again. So this sounds like another situation just like that. Exactly. And in this case, uh, it was a, a pharmacist that this Daniel Reese was uh, an apprentice to, who was part of the shenanigans, and then a local attorney who was part of it too. They did the initiation, which was uh, demeaning. They had him uh, supposedly kiss the Masonic book which they lowered their trousers and made him kiss their behinds. You know, very, very uh, cruel type of joke. Mm -hmm. But they weren't satisfied. And they decided to do it on the next occasion. Franklin was not aware of this, he says, he claimed, because this made the American Mercury with Franklin castigated. It uh, uh, really embarrassed Franklin's family. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a public shaming by the American Mercury, blamed more on Franklin than on the perpetrators. So what did they do? They decided to have one of the perpetrators dress with horns and uh, an animal skin to look like the devil. And Reese uh, was uh, conv convinced that he needed to make a pledge for the Masonic group to the devil, which of course never happens, never will, never has. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a total aberration. He did so. 
first they gave him a purgative, which was, would be a kind of early X-lax uh, to make him uh, his bowels loosened and to embarrass him there. Mm -hmm. And then they had some kind of boiling chemical. Apparently it may have had some brandy with it. Uh, we've heard of this before where uh, there's these different concoctions that are used in a hazing. But they lit it on fire. And for some reason, the uh, pharmacist threw the whole boiling substance on Reese, and he was in agony and uh, died of his wounds. I mean, essentially, he was burned to death. Uh, so that's 1737. It made the American mercury. The scandal went on quite some time because newspapers took time to get out. It took time. Uh, for uh, the news to spread in the colonies. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last uh, public statement, Franklin said, he said he hoped that this would not be the one thing the public remembered him for. Mm -hmm. He was embarrassed by this. He said he had no idea that they would take it this far. And he disavowed any connection, not with the Masonic group, but with these perpetrators. Yeah, that is just an incredible story. And, you know, I think about college students today and the fact that many times they might get involved in some of these hazing incidents, and I'm sure they don't really give much thought to what's gonna happen in the future and how this could possibly prevent them from achieving whatever their goals are. All college students come in with high aspirations of doing some wonderful things. Benjamin Franklin certainly did some amazing things in his lifetime, but I'm sure he, he wasn't very proud of this particular incident um, and this particular organization. And I just wonder if college students really think about that. Do they um, have the opportunity to think about what the repercussions might be, how this could prevent them from achieving their goals, whatever their goals might be? Because once they're in the newspaper, and now with Google and everything else, you're looking for a job and they're doing research to see what your social media accounts look like and what comes up in Google when we do a Google search. If you're associated with a hazing death, God forbid, I mean, your chances of landing your dream job are really starting to shrink. Um, and so and, I wonder. And for me, I'm, uh, you know, Benjamin Franklin is an early hero for me. I've read two biographies mm -hmm. of Franklin, which is where I learned about this in the first place. And um, he really should not have tolerated the first prank. First, it was debasing uh, to d the young man, Daniel Reese. Number two, it was dishonoring his organization that he had pledged affiliation to. And, and I guess the other is, um, he would have hoped he would have had more consideration for the victim. Right. To not allow something demeaning like this. Yeah. Uh, this goes beyond horseplay. It, it definitely uh, was way over the line. Uh, and Franklin may not uh, have been responsible for the death but he absolutely could have stopped this one cold. Yeah. Wow, that's unbelievable. The next case that I know you wanted to talk about happened in 1890, where a minister was killed in a Masonic organization. What happened in that particular case? Okay, well, this was the Royal Arch. This was hunting West Virginia. It was a Reverend J.W. Johnson, uh, who was joining the group after moving to the West Virginia area. And this was another nonsensical initiation involving climbing up and down out of a hole in the dark. Johnson fell, uh, was very, very injured, and succumbed of his injuries a few days later. So this was a physical hazing involving a quote-unquote prank. Right. Wow, another activity went wrong. Then uh, later, six years later in 1896, we run into the Elks. What happened in that particular case? This is one of, when we count fraternity deaths, mm -hmm. uh, one of many electrocutions. This was 1896, as we said, with the Elks. Edward W. Curry uh, was uh, uh, put into a kind of hot seat. He was shocked. He got blood poisoning, and that was the official cause of death blood poisoning after being 
electrocuted. And this again, this happened in the late 20s with Delta Kappa Epsilon at the University of Texas. We've talked about that, I know. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that there was an inadvertent uh, electrocution at SUNY Albany when uh, they had a kind of immersion in water with one of the groups and it was electrified and one of the young men died. Uh, there, and we're gonna talk about others too. Mm -hmm. But that was 1896. And before the century was over, we had two more. Uh, 1899, the first of two Catholic-related deaths. Uh, this was the Catholic Young Men's Association, which we had in my parish uh, in uh, Chicawaga, New York, growing up. Uh, it's what we played basketball for. It was a very uh, good group. But with this one, uh, apparently, it was physical hazing and pummeling in the dark. And uh, when it was all over, uh, a, a young man perished when he was beaten uh, in this one. And then uh, also in 1899, another royal arch, but slightly different from the 1891, in that this was a trade association. There's always these uh, spinoffs, mm -hmm. if you would call it, for some of these organizations. What happened with this is a traveling salesman who was master of ceremonies thought it would be a fun idea to go beyond mere paddling, which as we know is something uh, the, the Greeks have been trying to get rid of for some time. And there's d good helpful discussions about the paddle and its meaning and uh, whether or not it, it's time to make some changes. I'm not ready to get into that now, but it's, uh, the paddle's been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. Okay, what he did is he attached a gun barrel to it and turned it into a working weapon with a single bullet. And when it was paddled, it went off and uh, he shot the victim who, uh, uh, this was in Carbondale, shot the victim uh, who went down and a few days later, he also died of a bullet wound. Uh, it's like, I guess my question for you, Mike, how, do, how does somebody even come up with something so inane and, and how do others not say, guys, this is not a good idea? Right. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know. It, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think, you know, I, I was watching a program where they were looking at old antiques and somebody had brought out a paddle that actually had some gunpowder essentially embedded into the paddle so that way when it did hit that it would make a much louder sound so um you know so how all of that plays in you know i don't know um, but the more i hear about some of these older hazing cases the more i start to think about um the relevance to what's happening today because of course you know we've seen incidents where people have been shot even recently in certain hazing cases maybe they didn't die perhaps there was an injury uh certainly the pummeling i mean we saw the pummeling of course at uh texas a and m in terms of the band uh hazing death that we had there um you can also look at baruch college would be another example of where they did some pummeling that happened out in pennsylvania on their retreat so, you know, all of these things, they seem to come back. I mean, it, it seems that there's this recurring theme that you see in terms of hazing, that it just keeps coming back and back. Yeah, the one that, uh, as you know, got me started, the death of John Davies at the Vatterino, uh, that was 1975. He was beaten and was not able to resist. He was a big, strong uh, football player for the Nevada Wolfpack, who could have easily taken somebody. There was a small, they described him as a smaller member who just mercifully beat him and he was unable to fight back. And then of course he succumbed to, to alcohol, but uh, he was in rough, rough shape that, uh, and how it could have ever gotten that far, you know, mm. wonders. Yeah. Well, then, we, uh, let's see, oh. the early 1900s, you also had some others, 1913, the Loyal Order of the Moose. That right. was something, what happened there? A Loyal uh, Order of the Moose, we had two deaths, and uh, a Donald Kenny and a Christopher Justin. Uh, and uh, in this particular uh, case, the details are sketchy. Uh, this happened in Birmingham, uh, Alabama. 
and the newspapers did, never did get all of the investigation. But at the end of the initiation, two men were dead. Some kind of physical hazing, some kind of either shenanigans or uh, over the top behavior that resulted in two deaths. This is on my list to do more research for the new book. Uh, there's a couple that I'm uh, doing. Uh, in fact, uh, I found out more about one death just today. I also found uh, for the new book, and I'm not posting these yet, another death involving uh, a young man at an Eastern school at the same time a famous uh, future American writer was a student there. Death occurred at the same time. How did I find this one? I was looking up the writer and going through journal articles and my mouth uh, opened. Like, how could I have not ever heard of this? Uh, but it was a case in which a young man was beaten with a baseball bat, a perpetrator, by, by one of the quote unquote victims and died after he left, after he was expelled from the school. And so uh, it did not make a lot of newspaper press at the time. And so this was a scholar who discovered this, and I will give him credit in the new book. But it just, my, my jaw drops when I, I've been finding so many uh, additional ones. I thought I had had them all. Now I know there's others still out there that I have to locate or someone else has to locate. Mm -hmm. I also, in 1929, there was another case out of uh, the Knights of Columbus, which is a, a huge organization. What happened to that situation? That's a, 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 that's a, a prominent uh, a Catholic organization. In this one, a, a gentleman by the name of John C. Uh, Van Sistine uh, was killed, and, and that was also physical hazing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Physical hazing then was a catch all term. And it's interesting, 1929, uh, it was two years deep into a national attempt to get rid of physical hazing in fraternities. That started about 1927, and also to get rid of physical hazing in freshman, sophomore initiations. And as you know, after the 20s, there was one, one death too many, one death from physical hazing at Cheney State. Uh, and so it, that always gives me hope that we can stop this because uh, really the number of physical hazing incidents was much, much higher up through the 20s. Mm -hmm. Wow, okay. that's really interesting. I just, I can't believe how many of these adult service groups were talking about hazing deaths. You also have a couple of incidents for the Elks, one in 1942 and another one in 1945. Do you know what happened there? Okay, the uh, 1942 with the Elks, uh, that's the one I discovered today. Oh, and so okay. if, you, if you go to hanknewer.com, hazing deaths, I put the clipping in. The gentleman's name uh, was Cephas Mills. I have more work to do because it turned out it went under police investigation. Uh, this is a little harder to track because it was an African-American publication. And so I've got to find which library uh, uh, in Baltimore save the newspapers. It's a little hard now with the coronavirus. I'm really getting stifled uh, with libraries being closed. This has been really a tough, tough time to be a researcher. Uh -huh. but, uh, what happened there, what's known is that he was to sit on the electric chair, sat and died instantly. When police were called, it was thought, according to the newspaper, that he died of fright. But uh, the coroner and police were looking into the possibility that he actually was shocked and died the same way the University of Texas, a young man died. So stay tuned. I'm, I'm searching uh, this one. Uh, I may have to deal with universities in Baltimore to go into these African-American publications to try to find out. But I think uh, as in most of these cases, no charges were forthcoming. Police investigated some of, several of these. It's always looked at as an unfortunate accident. Huh. That, that was the norm. Then 1945, another shock. Uh, this time, uh, the uh, victim 
1945, uh, was shot with an electric razor that was purposely short-circuited uh, uh, to give this uh, person a shot. And that was July 1945. Oh my goodness. And then we don't have another one, and, and we have only one more, one too many, 2004. This is probably one of the saddest of cases. A gentleman by the name of uh, Albert Eid, E-I-D, uh, brought a real gun to the initiation by mistake. They thought they were going, he thought he was firing blanks uh -huh. when uh, a, a young father was get, trying to get into this Masonic group in Patchogue, New York. He shot him point blank in the face and killed him instantly. Uh, Albert was arrested, police investigated, and uh, he was 76 years old, about my age, and was let off. Uh, he was, uh, according to the descriptions, uh, a little bit addled. Of course, he was shaken. I'm sure he was shaken. But um, why he did not get involuntary manslaughter is beyond me. I, I really believe that uh, this was a miscarriage of justice. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that is the very last one. And I hope we'll not be talking about another one in, in a, one of these esteemed organizations. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing all of this with our audience because you know, without spending this time with you, I never would have known about this many uh, adult service group uh, hazing deaths. This is quite a list. Uh, and I just had no idea that it was this pervasive and hopefully we don't have any more going forward, but uh, clearly you see over time, then this is a much bigger thing than just fraternities and sororities. It's really all organizations. It is Mike. And one, the one thing I think I want to emphasize, the Patchogue one in 1974, and then the Benjamin Franklin case were the only ones that made the uh, wide national news. The others were very short uh, articles in papers, such as the African American paper. Uh, they were not national scandals by any means. Fraternities, mm -hmm. on the other hand, uh, were given a lot of press whenever there was a death. Yeah, that strikes me as odd. You know, certainly with the Benjamin Franklin, I understand why that would be a national news story, given his contributions. But for the others to really get a small mention somewhere in a newspaper and it doesn't become a national story, it's interesting how these are really viewed as accidents, unfortunate accidents. But then when we look at fraternity and sorority uh, hazing deaths, it's, it's viewed much differently. Yeah, and I, th I think it's fair to say, uh, with several of these being deaths of African Americans, the press ignored crime stories as well as ignored the good things that were going on. I mean, there's a shameful, uh, long, uh, shameful past for newspapers in terms of coverage of African Americans and other minorities. And this would be a, a prime example. Uh, had it occurred uh, in a Caucasian group, I think it would have gotten much more attention. Yeah. I think you're right about that, unfortunately. But uh, wow, well, thank you so much for sharing all this information. I, I clearly have some more reading to do now with uh, some of these, uh, these various cases. So uh, I appreciate you bringing it forward. And as always, I enjoy our time together. So I can't wait until next week when we dig into uh, some additional cases. But thank you so much for sharing that with our audience today. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I enjoyed the discussion very much. Yes. All right. We'll see you next week uh, for another episode of Making Hazing History with Mike and Hank. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time.